comes in different packages, and feeling blessed in the middle of all of those packages is a different story. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me and when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. And then the, the kicker line in the whole thing to me is you give and take away. Right? See what you remember. I'll, I'll yell the words at you all the way. You know, make a real worshipful atmosphere out of it all. Here we go.
for taking us this far and for the faith that you've given us to believe that you will take us all the way to that place when we finally finish and we are with you. So we bless your name. Amen. Have a seat. That song uh, has kind of been bouncing around in my head this week uh, for a couple of reasons. One, because um, I talked to Bobby Davidson on the phone this morning and uh, talk about God giving, giving back what I thought he was about to take. Um, really quite a... What a momentous, I, I got very emotional just hearing her voice because I really did wonder if I'd ever hear it again. And it was uh, a lovely, a lovely moment and I prayed for her. Um, Sarah, her daughter, told me that she was uh, today sitting on the side of the bed. She's breathing on her own. There's no, not even any oxygen wow. there. Uh, she's going through occupational stuff, you know, you gotta have to learn to brush your teeth again and all that stuff when your body hasn't moved for almost three weeks. And uh, so the Lord gives. And then if you um, read uh, Babette Larry's prayer request, and many of you know Babette, some of you don't, but Babette uh, was kind of off and on here for the last maybe three years or so. Um, but her daughter is dying. We've prayed for Laura uh, for quite a bit, off and on. And uh, I read, I read that, and I wrote to her because she lives up in Oregon. Although the whole family is in is in Arizona right now to be with Laurel in her last um, season. And then Babette wrote back to me, and her words just really, really were impactful to me, anyway especially as we think of God taking away. Um, can't, think of, can't think of anything worse than a parent having to say goodbye to a child. But in that sense that um, she responded to my, my email to her um, quite gratefully, but she was very honest. And I just want to share some of the things she said, because I think some of you would share that. Come on in, Jane. Come in. Uh, she said, I have a lot of why questions, and a lot of how strong is my faith questions, and a lot of how much can we possibly endure questions. I do try to remember that this is temporary, even though I can't imagine a time that I will ever feel normal again, or truly happy, or without tears that are ready to fall. I still pray for a miracle, even though I don't think that's God's plan. But then, of course, if, is it just my lack of faith? Have you ever been there? It all feels very complicated and outside my grasp or comprehension, so I pray for mercy, that she would not suffer, even though she is, that she would not linger one more day than necessary, that somehow our family will survive this and come out stronger and more uh, heaven-focused in our everyday lives, that this will actually mean something. I told Laurel that I wish that going to heaven was as simple as opening a door and walking through and that I would gladly take her hand and go with her. But I know that I can't. It's her time, not mine. And I know that there are many people in this room who have experienced some of these kinds of feelings. And I just love the way she grasped um, for things that in many ways you don't have an answer to. You're never, you'll never get them. Um, I think that the one thing that I, again, try to encourage her to know and, and to remember, and she knows it, she's walked with the Lord for a number of years, but um, the Lord is right there in the middle of those hearts, feels that sadness, and, and um, knowing that Jesus wept at the tomb of Lazarus, even knowing that he was going to raise him up, but he still cried. That's the heart of God. That's the God who enters into your heart, even though he knows what he's going to do, what he has done, and what he will always do, right? But God is not angered when our faith wavers. And he is not disappointed when we weep in brokenness. And he doesn't get up and leave when we express our anger and frustration with him. 
and he isn't silent as if he doesn't have answers for us. But if you can listen as his word speaks, there is a, what I would term a divine voice that whispers one sure truth in, in situations like this. And that is that we have all been designed for a world yet to come. When we, we carry this, this flame of eternity that God has put in our hearts, that's what the Bible tells us, right? And it continually goes and burns. And a life after this one um, is the one that we say we believe in. But in our brokenness and in sadness, it's easy to live as if all we have is this moment. And we're grasping for it. It took me back to when the, 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 the one thief uh, who hung on the cross at, at the point of death seemed to grasp who Jesus really was. The Lord said to him, as you know, truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. And it's interesting because a lot of times when Jesus spoke to somebody he was doing something nice for, he would say, your sins are forgiven. Or maybe he would say, who do you say that I am? Or maybe he would say, um, I, don't know. I don't know. I think that the purpose of bringing this up for me is that not only did Jesus want to focus that thief's mind on paradise, but Jesus' mind was also focused on paradise. Don't forget that. Jesus wanted that, theme, that thief to find hope. And I think it was Jesus' love for the world uh, that not only helped him carry the weight of sin and obviously the, the, to face the wrath that you and I could not face on our own. That was one of the things that, it was that love that he had in his heart that allowed him to be on that cross. But I, I think we can also believe that he knew he was going back to where he, it all started, right? He had left paradise. He knew where he was headed. There was hope there. And Jesus wanted that thief to know it. I, I read uh, something that Paul Tripp wrote with regard to that whole idea of paradise. I wanted to read this to you. Here's the real life street level issue. If you don't keep the eyes of your heart focused on the paradise that is to come, you will try to turn this poor fallen world into the paradise it will never be. In the heart of every living person is the longing for paradise. And I love these analogies. The cry of a toddler who's just fallen down is a cry for paradise. The tears of the school-aged child who's been rejected on the playground are tears of one reaching out for paradise. The pain of aloneness that a person without friends or family feels is the pain of one longing for paradise. The hurt the couple feels as their marriage dissolves is the hurt of those crying out for paradise. The sadness that the old man feels as his body weakens is the sadness of one who longs for paradise. I relate to that one. We all have this longing, even when we're not aware of it because it was placed there by our Creator. He's placed eternity in each one of our hearts. Our cries are more than cries of pain. They are cries of longing for more and better than we will ever experience in this fallen world. When you forget this, you work very hard to try to turn this moment in the, into the paradise it will never be. Your marriage will not be a paradise. Your job will not be the paradise you long for. Your friendships will not be the paradise your heart craves. The world around you will not function like paradise. Your children will not deliver paradise to you. Even your church will not live up to the standard of paradise. If you're God's child, paradise has been guaranteed for you, but will not be right here, right now. All the things that disappoint you now are to remind you that this is not all there is, and to cause you to long for the paradise that is to come. Amen. The dreams that die remind you that this is not paradise. 
The flowers that wilt remind you the same. The sin that captivates you should remind you that this is not paradise. The diseases that infect you are to remind you that this is not paradise. Live in hope, because paradise is surely coming. You resonate with that at all? Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's it's important for us because we have to we're gonna we're gonna walk through times like this. It's guaranteed. It's guaranteed. Why? Because this isn't paradise. And the thing that that longing in your heart and in my heart that wants every moment to be fulfilling and great, that doesn't want to have to face when a dog dies, or doesn't want to face when a child dies, or doesn't want to face when you get fired, or when you have that argument with your spouse, or when your spouse is gone. This is not paradise. And it's not to, and it's not to say, don't feel what you feel, you're going to walk through it. But God is going to walk through it for you because he's there the whole time saying, this isn't all there is. And I will get you there. I will get you there. I want you to, I want you to embrace that. Let's start with an anthem called Timeless One today.